right, good morning. Did you, did you all hear that? Hey, it started. <laughs> Thanks, Bella. Hey, it started. Uh, good morning. Welcome to service this morning. Uh, I'm doing announcements, and so the first announcement is about small groups. And so if you know about small groups or you don't know about small groups, um, we're going to have three different small groups starting this week. So the, one of them is on Wednesdays, and it is uh, with, so two of them are on Wednesdays actually, so one of them is all about going through the New Testament, and um, so I'm going to be kind of doing the discussion and leading that, and it's going to be Wednesdays at 7, and we're going to look through the Immerse New Testament, which it's out there, and so if you would like to join that small group and talk about what the Bible is saying, um, I encourage you to come to that. And also, the youth Bible study is also at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. And so that will also be here at the church. So if you have a teenager or you know a teenager who would be encouraged by getting into the Bible and learning more, let them know that we're starting a youth Bible study. The last one's going to start on Sundays, but not this Sunday. Next Sunday at 6.30 in the evening. This one is called Life Healing Choices, and it's all about... Um, Growing in where we are and what we're supposed to do as believers. Also, it, it is almost October. Did you guys notice that? Wow. Okay, so uh, next Saturday, there is Kingdom Unification is a prayer ministry with the whole community, and it's going to be at our church next Saturday at 8 a.m. So if you would like to come uh, pray, there's going to be other churches invited and uh, we're going to kind of celebrate who God is and just pray for community, the world, needs throughout the morning. After that, on Sunday the 3rd, so next Sunday, if you are interested in learning more about our church and you are possibly interested in finding out about membership, we're having a class called Foundations, which is our membership class, and uh, that will be directly after service at Lake 12 to 3. So if you've been coming here and you're interested in learning more about the church or if you're interested in membership, come and we will have lunch at that time. <laughs> there you go. I'm not the best at doing announcements, just throw that out there. The last thing is, uh, it's kind of far away, but on October 31st, we are going to have an outreach after service. So does anybody like chili? All right, does anybody make chili? Rare. All right, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a chili cook-off um, from like, we're starting about one, uh, about 1230. And so if you make chili or you like chili or you know somebody who makes chili in the community, invite them. We're going to celebrate who God is. We're going to have chili and we're going to vote and have a, have a big fun time. And actually it's the Steelers versus Browns at one o'clock. And so I'm making it so we can watch the football game and eat chili and have activities and it'll be a fun time uh, to just reach into the community and people like chili so it's that time of year so invite people uh, encourage people to come and let me know if you are a person who wants to make chili also and it'll be a lot of fun and the kids yes actually the same day the kids are going to have a fun special activity during service also called Candy Palooza. And so if you like candy and you're a kid, you're going to want to come and probably invite your friends because it's going to be a fun time of getting extra candy and fun things. And also you're allowed to wear your costumes. Yeah, that's you're allowed to dress up for church and in your class and it's going to be a lot of fun. And it'll be fun, 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 candy and dressing up. And chili. And chili afterwards. So... <laughs> So it'll be a lot of fun, so let your moms and dads know, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends at school, that there's going to be fun candy time at church. So if they want candy too, they can come hang out and have candy. Lastly, if you are new here, it's your first time, or you've been here a few times, and you have not filled out a connection card, uh, make sure you grab one. If you haven't, there's some right there next to the offering, baskets in the back. Uh, fill it out and place it in there. That way we can 
uh, get a hold of you and just say thank you for joining us today. So, lastly, I think I've said lastly like four times now, but lastly, it is birthday Sunday, so would you come up, Kathy? September birthdays, anybody? There's one.
Kids can be dismissed to their class.
Almighty. He is the King of all kings. He is over all situations. When we don't know what to do, He is for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are holy. You are mighty. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You reign over all things. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord God, that you continue to encourage us this morning. Help us to seek you fresh and new today. so, so holy. He is worthy. He is mighty in all situations. So Friday and yesterday, we got to, we got to have a men's retreat, and it was a lot of fun. Um, thank you to the, to the men who helped put it together. We got to be there and, and join together, and it was a lot of fun. It was very encouraging. Uh, we had a friend of mine who is who is spending time doing missions and is probably going to be spending months with his whole family, his wife and his kids, uh, doing missions next year in Malawi. Um, and so he encouraged us to to break the chains or the, the binds that hold us when we, when we allow ourselves to be fastened to things of this world, whether they're good or bad, things of this world, we lose step following after the Father, but He is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If we fasten ourselves or tie ourselves to this world, Things of this world can't be with him. We end up pulling ourselves away. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be people who, who pull ourselves away. We want to walk in step with the Spirit or with the Father. That's what it's all about. So, it was a lot of fun. And uh, if you're interested and you didn't get to come this time, we try to do it once a year. So, be ready next September. Think about it now. We'll probably all forget until then, but think about it. God is good. So this morning I'm, I'm talking about um, something that I've been, been hearing about and, you know, praying about and thinking about for a while now. And um, has anybody heard the, the band Rend Collective? Rend Collective? No? There we go. One person, maybe two. They're on K-Love, but Build Your Kingdom Here is a song that has been fairly popular, or Lighthouse. They're on K-Love. Anyway, all right, so their, their name is Ren Collective, and I like them. They're a silly Irish band, and I'm Irish, so I like them. But anyway, their name is Rend Collective, and I always thought that was a funny word, Rend, right? And so I, I've, I've thought about this for a while now, and so I, I, I decided to look into a little word study of the word rend in the Bible. And I found there's two verses in the Bible that have this word rend. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about the rest of the service. Um, but the title of my message is, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And so when we look at this, we, we see this, this overwhelming sense of revival, this overwhelming sense of God's Spirit here moving and, and, and being with us. And so I looked up the, the definition of revival, and when you look up the definition of revival in, in the Webster's Dictionary, it's like, well, revival is just revive. I was like, thanks, dictionary. Sometimes the dictionary is not the best, right? So I, I decided to look up the word revive in 
in the Webster's Dictionary defines it as to return to consciousness or life or to become active or flourishing again. Who wants to see something revived right now? Amen. Return to consciousness or life. And, and it's amazing because there's, there's something stirring. There's something going on. And, and maybe you're a person who's been feeling that too. So I want to talk about this idea of revival. And so I looked up uh, two, two revival leaders in the past and what their definition of the word revival was. Robert uh, Coleman, Coleman, excuse me, Robert Coleman said, the awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. What is your true nature and purpose? And Charles Finney said, the return of the church from their backsliding and the conversion of sinners. Does anyone want to see that definition of revival happen in this church, in this community, in the world right now? A returning, a reviving, a, a coming back to the, the awakening of true purpose. We talk a lot about purpose in, in the world, and everybody wants to find their purpose, right? There's books written about it, there's there's secular Christian books about purpose, but, but in reality, to revive or revival means coming back to the real purpose of what God has for us. Revelation 3, 2 said, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you move through this message. We ask, Lord God, that you, that you inspire us, you lead us, you guide us, Lord God. We want, to be, we want to be equipped and tied to you, Lord God, and follow in step with you, Lord Jesus, as you lead us into truth, into knowledge, into understanding, because you are our King of all kings and our Lord of all things. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 I have a question. How many of you believe you have been a part of a revival or you've seen a revival from a distance? Maybe here. So, yeah, revival. It's amazing, right? We talk about revival a lot, but a lot of times seeing it and experiencing it is a little bit different. So if you turn with me to Isaiah 64, where I get this idea of rend. Isaiah 64, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Oh, that you may rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as with fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down and to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you. Who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Isn't that powerful? I enjoy Isaiah. I enjoy Isaiah a whole lot. I think Isaiah is a powerful book of, of, of seeing God's kingdom come and, and, and Jesus coming and, and conquering through his sacrifice. They missed it a little bit when he came. They're like, why isn't he a reigning king? Why isn't he a ruling monarch? Because he's the king who laid himself down. So rend the heavens. Maybe you've read this before and you've thought, wow, God, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. We want to see the earth quake. We want to see the world change. We want to see your enemies, the, the darkness flee. Oh, that you would come down. We want to see that happen today. Do we not? Amen. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. 
I believe revival is something that we long for so often, right? There's books written about it. Uh, I was looking through a book in my office. It's called something like Revival something or other. And, and he starts the book off by saying, I am a, a pastor and I have a plethora of books called something about revival in my library. And now I believe that it's my turn to write a book about revival. So we long for it all the time. We cry out to God, God, send us revival, send, send us something new, right? Revive our hearts, revive our land, revive our churches, revive us, oh Lord. And we, we go to prayer services, we go to things, we go to revival services, we, we spend time pouring out our hearts to God. God, give us revival, help us, help us in this time of need, right? And we see God moving. Sometimes we feel feel power in these meetings and these in these services and we, we we feel the holy spirit moving and and speaking to us and, and 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 there's something happening and we we see oh yes revival is here now and yes i believe it is but there's something that we're missing something that we're missing because sometimes we go to those meetings and we we feel the holy spirit moving on us and we we maybe prophesy or we we get chills or you know fall in the spirit and we're just we're just powerful right and then oof, god was amazing then we leave the building oh god is so good we, we come over here we get in our cars right god is so good we, we sit down in our cars we drive away we go home go back to our couch or a lazy boy or a bed Fill in the blank. Your favorite spot. Everybody's got one, right? Everybody's got a favorite spot. You go back to your favorite spot and you just think, wow, God, you're amazing. Remember when. Then days go by. Weeks go by. Months go by. Years go by. You're like, remember when? We were there. God, that you would just do that again. Because I just want to feel you again. I believe sometimes we get stuck in this monotony of life that pulls us away from the definition that we saw before of drawing back to the church's true purpose. Our true purpose is not simply to experience God in a place like this or under a tree, like Nancy Hudson likes to talk about how, how their movement started in Africa or in a tent those are amazing times of worship and, and powerful times to experience God. But there's something we're missing. And I, I believe it stems from this idea that, that Isaiah writes shortly after that, rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains will tremble. But he goes on to say in verse 2, as when fire sets a twig ablaze and causes water to boil, why come down to make your name known to your enemy? Now, sometimes I feel like when we, when we experience these things, we have a wrong motivation. We call for revival. We, we long for revival. Not, not that we actually want to see something change, but we want to see something change without us because we're already good. It's just as those people over there, they, they need revival. I'm, I'm good right here, and I, I experience something. Oh, God, you're moving. Oh, you're speaking to me and through me, and, and we're, we're, it's powerful moving right here, but outside of here, what happens? Nothing. Sometimes that happens, and too often that happens, right? And we can look throughout history and maybe throughout our lives that, that, that something more has happened than just that, but, but a lot of times, go to these revivals and then we just go home. We experience God and that's a, that's a powerful, important thing to do. And I'm not saying anything against meeting together and, and glorying in his name, but sometimes we, we just, well, God, just fix our enemies. God, fix them over there. They've got problems. We're all good here, but they've got problems. Fix them. That's what Sometimes we get the wrong motivation of revival, the wrong perspective of revival because we think it's an outward expression of what God wants to do. But in reality, it's something more than that. 
We pray for revival. We seek revival. We, 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 we want to see it come, but in reality, we just want to see someone else's life ablaze because we feel like ours is fine. But I've found throughout Scripture that revival never happens like that. Never. I've been doing study and I've been looking at it and, and maybe you're, you're, you're thinking, you're sitting there thinking, I've, Pastor Ed is going crazy again. We just need more prayer services. We need more talking about revival. He's gone crazy again. Sometimes I am crazy. I, I, I truly believe that, that if, if I am in the wrong, then it is up to God and the church to help me. Because we are all not perfect. Me or you, right? But So I may be totally wrong, but, but ask yourself, when was the last time that you prayed for revival and saw something happen more than just yourself feeling something? That, because revival, in a sense, is, can't be just you. It has to be something happening around right? It has to be palpable. It has to be a family or a job and something changes. And I'm saying n things change all the time when we pray and we believe because there's something more. But if we want to see revival in the sense that people typically talk about it, of people coming to Christ, the church is filled and all of this drawing, if we want to see that, we have to do more than just come to an extra service once a week. Or pray a little bit more. We've got to do something more. So I, I want to illustrate my point with, with, with a story from Joshua. Because Joshua is, is, a, is a powerful book about um, the people of Israel entering the promised land, right? And so Joshua was, was Moses' uh, understudy or assistant. And, and he was with Moses all those years. And, and he's the one who said when, when the twelve went into the land and they, they looked at it and they're like, oh yeah, it's too big, they're too hard, they're too scary, right? The world is too big and too hard and too scary for us. Anybody agree with me? I'm not a very big person. I'm not the strongest person. I'm not the, right? Maybe you're bigger, stronger than me, but essentially all of us will fail somewhere, right? So the 10 versus the two, they were like, no, it's too hard, too big, too whatever. But Joshua was one of the ones who said, no, 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 no. God will do it. God will do it. And so we, he continues, and then so they end up going in the same place that they ran away from. Years later, they entered into the land and marched around that wall of Jericho, and they literally did nothing but marched around and trusted God. Sometimes all we got to do is trust God, but what did they do? They were present in the fight. They didn't pick up a sword. They were present. And then so the, the walls fell down. Everyone was demolished. Everything was, was desolated. And then none of the people of Israel were hurt. And then so, so it goes on. And, and so the, the next fight comes. And, and so there's this next town, right? So, so they just marched in the biggest, baddest city. They just marched around it and it fell down. Wow, God is awesome. Oh, there's a little town over there. And so Joshua says, I'll just send some because God... Look what God did over there. He's going to be easy for the town called Ai. But something changed. So in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, it says, But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the, devotion, to the devoted things. Achan, son of all these different people, you know, he's in the tribe of Judah, took some of the stuff. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent, sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Vanel and some other places, and says, go spy the city out, right? So then, so the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned, they said, not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it. And do not worry all the people, right? Because it was a small town, especially compared to Jericho. So, about 3,000 men went up, but they were 
They were rooted by, routed by men of Ai who killed about 60, no, 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone's quarry and struck, down, struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua, Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. Now rend and tore are essentially the same word, right? So we see this happening. We, we see that, that, that the people of God had a great victory. But instead of staying faithful to what God wanted them to do, their true purpose, Achan, this one, this one guy, one guy, thought he knew better. And he stole something and he held something. And sometimes when, when we get stuck in this, in this way that, 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 oh, let's just say the right words. Let's just do this thing. But in reality, there's something going on underneath. We have, we have burdens. We have anger. We have things going on. We're hindering the amazing thing that God wants to do. And then we see Joshua, he comes and he falls down in, his, in front of the altar, right? And so sometimes in those, in those meetings that, that, that we're calling for revival, all we do is we, we come and we fall at, at God's feet. We're at the altar, we're crying, we're, we're, we're asking him, God, why is this not working? God, why is this not helping? God, why aren't we seeing more people come to Christ? God, why, why, why? That's what Joshua's doing. I really love the next verse because I love when the Bible shows God, I'm going to say, God's humor. All right, verse 7. No, verse 10, excuse me. Then the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Get up. Get up. And then he says, what are you doing on your face? Could you imagine, right? You're, 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 you're in a place of, of, of crying out to God, you know, God, this, this, there's something going on in my life, I can't, in my family, all these things, and I'm just crying out to you, God, please, why? I don't understand why it's not working. I don't understand. This is not good. And you just, God's like, get up. Why are you, what are you doing down there? Stand up. I have called you to be something greater. I have called you to be something more, more than a conqueror. Get up. Why are you on your face? It's a very weird verse. But God says, why? What are you doing down on your face? Why are you cast down like that? It's so strange, right? Because most of the time, when we, when we think about, you know, we want to follow after God, we want to see these things, that's what we do. That's the go-to when we want to see God move. Why are you on your face? The Bible says that you are more than conquerors with Jesus Christ. And this is before Jesus Christ had come. But God had told him, be strong and courageous in his mighty power. Joshua, excuse me, Joshua was a man who God had called to be more than a conqueror. And he's like, yeah, sometimes life is difficult, man. Get up. Be the leader, be the man I have called you to be, and I'll be faithful with you. So verse 11, it says, Israel has sinned, so God's still speaking. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the, devo the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. That is why Israel can't stand against their enemy. Did you hear that verse? That is why Israel can't stand against their enemy. Sometimes we, 
Like, yeah, you know, Aiken, man, that one guy. <clears throat> one guy's problem caused a whole nation to not be able to stand. Sometimes one of us will cause a whole church not to be able to stand. And now that's not a, that's not a thing to say, okay, well, point fingers, because in reality, God is the one who cleanses the heart. God sees our heart. Holy Spirit moves on people. And yes, sometimes we do encourage other people. Hey, you know, the way you're, this is not right. Let's walk together. But God is saying that because of their sin, they were not able to stand against the enemy. And because of our lack of following our true purpose, that's why we don't see the idea of revival all the time. Because sin and disobedience can look differently for all different things. This guy, meaning, you know, God said don't do something. In reality, the idea of not being able to take the spoils of war is kind of funny, right? That's what they did. You took over a city, the gold, the jewels is mine, but God said it's mine. Sometimes, when we go to those meetings, when we go home, we find that spot that we sit down or lie down, have we taken something that God said is his? And said, no, 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 this is my, my time. This is my time. And maybe it's not gold or silver or whatever it was that Achan took. Sometimes we take our time back. Sometimes we take our talents back. See, God, I don't want to, I'm too tired. Sometimes we take our voice back. So, we, so, so God goes on to say that, uh, go in verse 13, go consecrate the people, tell them to consecrate themselves in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted is among you. O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemy until you remove it. And so, so as the, the story continues, as the account continues, they, they, Joshua goes and he just talks to literally everyone until he gets to Achan. And finally Achan's like, yeah, actually it was me. It was me, right? And then so the, the, the truth comes out because the truth always comes out. It's difficult and it's awful. And sometimes when we try to hide the truth, it just comes out in even in hurt, more hurtful ways. So be honest, right? And then, and then we find that Achan said, okay, well, it was me. It's in my tent. It's buried in a hole. In my tent. And that is why they couldn't conquer AI. Sometimes the big reasons that we are not seeing something mighty and God's move in, in, in our lives and in our community is because we've buried a hole or we've dug a hole and we've buried something in it. Deep down inside ourselves, we're, we're talking about ourselves. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's trust or lack of trust. And we're saying, you know what? Those things I can hold on to. Those things that, that, that God has kind of said to me, it's fine because I'm just going to like hold on to it and just dig a hole, bury it in the hole. No one will ever know. And don't worry about it because no one will ever know. It's in the hole. It's just buried down there. But something will happen. Maybe, right? The amazing thing about this story is what was Achan's consequence when they went and fought AI? Nothing. But who got hurt? The people of God. Sometimes when we feel like, well, I mean, I've been, I've been holding on to this. I've been, you know, not letting go of this for a long time. And I've never had problems with it. It's actually kind of helped me to have an unforgiveness or, or, or to have this lack of whatever. It's actually helped me. But in reality, it has hurt those around you. God can't move because sometimes we hurt those around us. So essentially what happens, right? If you don't know the story, they, 
they brought the stuff, and Joshua was like, man, why'd you lie? And he's like, I don't know. And so they took him out and his family out and everything out, and they killed him. Now, obviously, we don't do that today because we are in the new covenant, and there's a lot, a lot of differences. But there is a huge connection when it comes to there's things in our lives that we need to do away with for real, not just hide in a hole till maybe later. We need to do away with completely. Because too often we cry out to God to rend the heavens and come down and send revival to us, but we have many things hidden in the holes, buried in our lives. And the amazing thing is that God is already here. I believe that sometimes we, we spend so much time, you know, just kind of like looking outward. The Bible says to stop pointing out the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own. You know, it's easy to, to point out somebody else's faults and why, why they need this, why they need to get better and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, it's us who need to start with this. If we want to see revival in our churches and communities, we need to recognize that we all of us, all of us who have come to Christ are the body of Christ. And if one part is sick, we're all sick, right? Because one guy's sin, the people of God could not conquer their enemy. If one of us is hurting, all of us are hurting. If one of us is in the wrong place, all of us miss out on what God wants to do. And that's why I believe it's so important that as the body of Christ, we work together. We, we, we grow in connection. And that's why, you know, the, the small groups that we're starting, if you're not a part of, if you haven't signed up for one, I encourage you to join one because it's going to be a great time of, of growing together. And, and hey, how can I help you be accountable? How, how can I bring you up and, and hold you here and, and, and help you? You know, it'll be different groups. But find one that either works with your schedule or the people are in it that you're like, yeah, those are the people that I, that I need to lift me up. I need to help me. Because when we all come to a place that we need someone else, that's when God will flourish. He's not calling us to be perfect, but he is calling us to, as a community, grow. And that's when revival starts. So Isaiah 46, he goes on, and, and Isaiah 46 starts off with this idea of rend the heavens and come down, but then he, he continues in verse 6, uh, and it's funny, Isaiah 46 is a, is a chapter that you probably have heard a lot of snippets of, uh, like this one, Isaiah 46, or, yeah, 64 verse 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteousness acts are as filthy rags all of them all of our good deeds are as fil filthy rags they are shriveled up like like a leaf and like the wind our sin sweeps us away no one calls on the name on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sin. Oh, here's another one people might know. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Do not become angry. Beyond measure, O Lord, do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. Now the idea of a potter in a, in a, on a wheel, right? Uh, I mean, probably our expert could explain it a lot more, but um, if you don't know, uh, Megan works with pottery in her job at the school. So I've never actually touched real pottery 
So this is just my perspective. But anyway, so it's difficult. Uh, and, you know, the thing's spinning, and you got to, like, shape it. And it's difficult. And sometimes you try to fix a problem, but it doesn't work. So you have to start all the way over and, and, and start fresh because sometimes the church has missed their true purpose, which is that definition of revival, right? Coming back to their true purpose the true purpose that God has put forth in us. Are we willing to be people who are molded by God? And if we are, I believe there is something amazing and mighty that's going to happen. Now, I've been talking a lot about Isaiah. Now, there's another prophet who I really like, and, and actually there's kind of a funny story uh, from my wife's family about this prophet. And so I'm not going to share all of it, but it's actually her dad's middle name, and it's Joel. So if you're in Isaiah, you could flip a handful of pages uh, to the prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2. I believe Joel is a, is a powerful chapter to help us understand what God wants to do in and through us. So Joel chapter 2, verse 12 is the other place we find this word rend. Joel chapter 2, verse 12, starts off, Even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Isn't that amazing? When we decide to say, Lord, please forgive me, because there are things in my, in my life, in my heart, that I've, that I've attached myself to, that I've buried down deep. Lord, forgive me of these things. He is faithful to do that. Joshua tore his clothes. He rended his clothes. And the Lord said, stand up. Why are you on your face? Because tearing of our clothes is not what Jesus wants. It's not what God wants. It's a rending of our hearts, allowing God to truly break our hearts for him. Like the potter on the wheel, if we're, if we're just pushing against, right? I don't know, maybe you have rocks in your clay, I don't know. None of us are perfect, right? That would be pretty terrible. So there was a rock and a piece of clay. It would not work very well. I'm just making all this up, but she's shaking her head. Yes, God is good. Wow. So, but right, but there's things in our lives that are that are hard, that are stuck, and it, if we're not allowing God to mold us into His purpose and His will, when when all we want to do is we want to just go and have a nice time at this meeting or, or at the service and, and then just go home and, and never let, our, let ourselves be changed into his real purposes. And we're like a, a rock or something. We just get, this is how I am. We have to humble ourselves. Joel is a very clear understanding of humbling yourselves before him and saying, I give it all to you. But the amazing thing is that he is compassionate and slow to anger. So when we do get boneheaded and we just are like, no, I'm going to go this way, God's like, I still forgive you. Will you just come back? Often that unforgiveness or that hurt is the thing that deep down we need to break. When we open up, right? When we dig that hole or rend our hearts, the thing that we haven't given to God yet is there. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's a worry. Whatever that may be, there's things in our lives. I believe that forgiveness is often, you know, unforgiveness is where fears spring from. It's where pride springs from. It's where arrogance springs from because it's a hurt that we have not forgiven and we try to protect ourselves with all these other things in our lives. In Matthew, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, 
others their sins, your Heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. That's why it's so powerful. It's so important that we spend time making sure that those past hurts, those past things we have forgiven, maybe, we, and, and the idea of forgive and, and, and forget is impossible. Because if anybody's ever hurt you in your life, you can't really forget it. You know it happened. I mean, you know, we all experience that. But forgive and let go. Because if that person or that situation, or that thing comes up and you have a, i got to protect myself. There's probably some past hurts that we have not forgiven, and we've let that thing fester in a dark hole in our lives. And we just hope it doesn't come up. But if we rend our hearts and we say, God, I open everything to you, no matter what, I surrender it all to you. I believe we see something powerful happening. We see a real freedom taking place in our lives that way. You know, in, in, in a lot of times in, in those revival meetings, and, and I think it's amazing that when we, when we desire and we, we spend time focusing more on Him, the more we, time we get together, the more time we build ourselves up in the most holy faith, it, faith is, a, is a powerful, important thing. But if we don't let that be a place to start and actually rend our hearts and say, I'm not just going just gonna to feel nice right now and then go home and nothing change. I'm going to actually change because I want to be changed. That we want to be changed and find real freedom in Jesus. And so, so in Joel, he, he's, he's preaching at, during a time where, where locusts had devastated the land. And, and so it was just this terrible land, right? And so, so Joel is preaching, and so he, he starts talking that, that God wants to do something more, but it takes us rending our hearts. And so he goes on to say in verse 25, I, I will, God says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm and the great armies that I sent to you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord who has worked wonders for you never again Will my be people be put to shame? Then you will know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord, the God, the Lord, your God. And that there is no other. Never again will my, my people be put to shame. It's amazing, right? And so if, we, if we, we take that idea and we say, okay, well, what does that look like today? Obviously, we're not talking about locusts eating our crops, but sometimes too often when we allow, when we allow those, those wishes and those worries and those fears and those doubts and those, all those things, the unforgiveness, all that stuff to creep in, we've lost something, right? The locusts swarmed. They came and they desolated the land. That was a long time, planting, waiting to harvest. The locusts real quick just destroyed it. But God said, I will repay the years that you have lost. If we've been stuck in, in unforgiveness, we've been stuck in this place of, of, I just wish things were better, but I'm not going to change myself to make them better, then when we come to him and we repent and we say, hey, I give it all to you, he will repay the years we have missed, the years that our, our selfishness has stolen real freedom from those things that hold us back, those things that, that, that have said, well, you, you shouldn't do this because you could get hurt. You shouldn't do this because what if somebody says, or what if somebody does, you don't do this. Real freedom in Christ. He will repay the years that the enemy or our selfishness has stolen from him when we're on the purpose and we're called according to his purpose. The last thing that Joel talks about is being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so Joel talks about uh, finding forgiveness or repenting. And then when we do that, we will see a great harvest. We will see a change happen in ourselves and in the land. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, I will, uh, for, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit 
unto all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my, on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire will billow. Billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For the Mount Zion and the Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Anybody ever heard that idea before? But not in Joel, right? The Apostle Paul talks about that. He, he shares that when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And the amazing thing is, like, how do we really, like, like do something? You know, if, 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 if going to a, to a revival service is not really good enough, well, what is it? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 9, verse 37-38, he said to them, then he said to his disciples... Anybody know what that says? The harvest is what? Plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the field. Who are the workers? Amen. We are. A lot of times we go to revival services like, well, oh, Lord Jesus, we want to see revival, you know, oh, hallelujah. And we feel like, we feel like there's, a, there's a power moving, there's a Holy Spirit moving. Oh, I feel him. Oh, hallelujah. But then we just go home and we find our seat. Amen, brother. What a great time that was. God send workers. Oh, I'm, I'm reading this. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in his field. Jesus need more harvest. We need more workers. Hallelujah. Send some workers. Send some workers. I'm going to go back to my lazy boy now. Ooh, thank you, God. It's a good time of prayer. He's going to send them. I know he is. God, you're sending harvest. That revival's coming. I'm going to sit here and watch my Netflix. Sometimes we read that verse and we're like, yeah, God do. Please send, please send them. But we are the workers. If we want to see revival, we must be the ones who start it. And yes, prayer is an important thing. And if we're not in prayer, if we're not worshiping God, if we're not loving God first, then we're going to be misguided. We're not following after the purpose that he has called us to. But the problem is that sometimes we, we spend so much time over there and we're just praying and praying and praying. Get up. Get off your face. I've got something for you to do, God says. Get up. The harvest is ready. The revival is ready. The reason we don't experience revival more often is because we're like Achan and we decide to take those things, our, our time, our, our treasure, our talents, our voice, our message, our witness, all of these things, and we hide them down in our hearts and we bury them in a hole because I don't want to do that. That's why we don't see revival more often. And I'm not saying it has to be a whole bunch of people, most revivals started with one person. Most started with one person being willing to speak. Matthew 10, 1, Jesus, asked, Jesus called his 12 disciples and told them and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. Jesus told that to them and then we know in Acts 2, right, we read Joel, where Acts 2, the, the Holy Spirit was poured out onto all flesh. We can see it in Acts 2, what Joel was prophesying way back when, that all flesh has the ability to have that power, to have that authority. Dream dreams, see visions, and prophesy. And the amazing thing 
that we see here, right? So, and in Acts 2, right, the Holy Spirit comes and, 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 and they begin being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, right, so something happens. The Holy Spirit comes. I'm not going to read all of Acts 2 because it's like the whole chapter. But in Acts 2, the people in the city started hearing something. Now, that is the first sign of something happening, right? And, and w would anybody agree Acts 2 is the start of a revival? Would you guys agree with that, right? I mean, at the end of Acts 2, there's like 3,000 new people to the church. So, so the Holy Spirit falls. Oh, that you may rend the heavens and come down. He did. But then the people hear something. Aren't these all Jews? How are they speaking in our language, right? And then so you, you, you can get into more of that, but, but then, then the people start hearing them speaking. So who shared at the first revival? Peter, right? Heard who speaking? Peter heard them speaking. There were about 120 people in that upper room. The Bible says it heard, they heard them speaking. Revival starts when we are willing to surrender our mouth and say, God, I don't know what to say. I just trust that you want me to say something. Help me to be a person in a situation where, where I can share because I want to be the spark that ignites a fire and, 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 and this person and that person, and I believe Joel is a powerful perspective, but it needs to start with rending our hearts. Oh, that you may rend the heavens and come down. He has. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, died for our sins so that we could be set free and we can be forgiven. And now the Holy Spirit has come in Acts 2, and now he is still here with us. We don't have to pray, oh, Lord, that you will come down because he is here in power and authority. Are we willing, like Joel, to say, I surrender all. I hold nothing back, unlike Achan, right? Get that out of there. Get that out of there. I surrender all to you because I want to see something change. I believe revival needs to start right here. If revival hasn't started here because we just enjoy being in these seats or in other places or wherever, then revival in the land will never happen. Revival starts in every single person. So I asked, um, you know, who had, yeah. Pastor Andy, could we sing I Surrender All? We probably could. There you go. I was actually going to call the, the worship team up, so as I, before I close, or I'm going to close in a minute, but then we'll sing I Surrender All. But let I, asked, I started by saying, has anyone been a part of or experienced revival? A few people raised their hands, right? I believe every single person who comes to Christ is a person who has gone from non-life to life. And that's what revive means, right? So every one of us have experienced revival. But wake up. There is something more, right? That's what Revelation said. And I believe that, that when we allow ourselves to be, to be stirred up and, and, and say, Lord, we want to see a move. If there's anything unclean or unworthy in my heart, rend my heart because I give it to you because I don't want to just spend some time singing and, and, and being with other God's people, which is an important thing to help us grow, to help us be disciples, to help us become men and women that God has called us to do, but to go out and to be a person that says, I, I have something to say. Listen. Listen. Get up off your face. Because we are free. And we are forgiven. And we are filled by the Holy Spirit when we allow him to do that, do that in our lives. But it takes us saying, yes, Lord. Here I am. Send me. That's how Isaiah starts, right? Isaiah got the call to become this, this powerful witness for Christ. 
when, when he got swept up into the heavens and God was looking around. Who will go? Isaiah said, here I am, pick me. Yes, Lord. And then, and then, and then, then the seraphim came and touched his mouth with the coal. I have ordained. And I believe that God has ordained all of us to be spokesmen, to be the witness, to be the person who goes from sleeping and helps other people to wake up, strengthen what remains. There will never, 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 never be missing from God. God will always do amazing things if we're willing to say, I will follow you, right? Awaken and quicken the awakening and quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. I thought that was a powerful, powerful thing, and that's what I want to close with. Are we awakened to our true purpose, to our true calling? Because God is going to do something amazing, because He always is. He's always working. He's always building up His church, because upon this rock, Hell cannot stay. Yeah, right? We are the church, but we can too often become like the people of Israel and allow those little things, maybe it's little, to come into our lives and be hidden in our hearts. So then His Spirit is not filling us, overflowing us, so I want to encourage you this morning that if, if you're feeling like there is things in my heart and in my, my life that I do need to rend, not my clothes, don't rend your clothes, please don't rend your clothes, <laughs> but is there something that I need to tear apart and say, God, I give this to you, I want to pray with you and I will I'll be up here, and I would love to pray with you, and uh, Lonnie, would you join me? And if you were a part of his Bible study this past summer, it was all about surrender, and revival, and repentance. So if you join me and pray with people, if, if, if you would like prayer for any reason, this or something else, we would love to pray with you as we sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one who is slow to anger and quick to compassion, Lord God. As soon as we choose to come back to you, you will take those things, Lord God. Help us to, to open up our hearts, open up our minds to you so that we don't just spend some time hoping for another Holy Ghost goosebump moment, Lord God but a powerful change in our lives and in our hearts and in the people around us because we want to see a, a fire start in this church, a fire start in this community, and it takes us being the workers, not somebody else. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that call. Help us to be like Isaiah and say, here I am, send me. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily.
when we are willing to surrender to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that there is a fire igniting. We thank you, Lord God, that there is a, a move right now, today. And it starts today and it continues on. Help us, Lord Jesus, to not just go back to our special spot where we sit every day, Lord God. Those are good things. Thank you for the rest and the Sabbath that you give us in those areas, in those places, Lord God. But call us to do more today. And this week, Lord God, as we as we move into the fall, as we move into the, the season to bless your name and the season to celebrate who you are, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. Give us opportunities to be the light in the darkness, Lord God. 
whether we're speaking about who you are and your goodness or we're speaking about your, your church, Lord God, or the family of God, help us to be the one who continues that spark. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for every person here, everyone watching, Lord God. Holy Spirit, continue to stir in hearts and minds. Thank you, Jesus. We ask that you... That you bless the offering, Lord God. Thank you so much that we get to honor you with our tithes, Lord God, with our offerings, with our gifts, Lord Jesus. That you have been so faithful to bless us, to, to provide for us. We ask, Lord God, that we want to bless and provide for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that we get to serve you and get to honor you in our giving. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.